Wesley yesterday. He sort of sat there for an hour looking at a lot of case histories. Today is going to be a bit different. It's not going to be mathematical, but you're going to learn a fair amount about time domain EM equipment and the actual details of, of what goes into them, why do they work as they do, what's important, etc., etc., etc. I will start with my slides, as always. Aha. Good. Okay, in general, I will be talking only about what we call impulsive type systems, those in which, as Alex has been talking about for the last couple of days, uh, transmitter waveforms which are step response, constant value, and then shut off. Uh, and these include our ProTEM system, the Crone, PEM, and DeepM, SiroTEM, MPPO, and Newmont. If anybody is interested later, I can briefly discuss the UTEM system, which is conspicuous by its absence in this list. Um, and that's mainly because it's not really sold. It's, it's operated by contractors and these other systems. Well, of course, Newmont would fall in that category too. But the others are, are all commercial instruments. Again, I'd like, uh, you know, I'd love to hear some questions or comments during the, uh, during the text. And uh, so if you feel, uh, feel something is, is not too kosher, give me a shout. Okay, the, the survey geometry that I will by and large deal with is the one that I know best which is the large loop moving receiver configuration. It's not widely used in Australia for what are probably excellent reasons, but I'll use it at any rate. The principles are the same, uh, and it doesn't really matter which system we're talking about in that sense. So I show here the large loop transmitter, which I talked about briefly the other day. The current consists, as it does with all of those systems, as a series of alternating um, rectangular pulses. I use the target, um, replace it with, it's a plate type target. Initially in free space, I replace the target with the equivalent resistance and inductance. And as Alex was saying yesterday, it's a stupidly simple model, but you can learn a hell of a lot from it. And if you really understand it, Moving on to the other ones is, is no great problem. Um, basically, the primary flux penetrates the target. Faraday's law causes an EMF to be generated in the target. Current flows, and it decays, as Alex told us this morning, with a time constant, which is a function, basically, of the conductance or conductivity of the target, depending on its geometry and its size, if you like. Uh, our measurement is made with, in this case, with a moving receiver coil. I show here the anomaly which we would actually get from a, um, a horizontal dipole receiver coil. And I illustrate the various profiles decaying with time as the transients decay in the, in the target. Okay, every slide on uh, from a manufacturer has to have one block diagram. Mercifully, mine is very short. There's my transmitter loop. There's the transmitter power supply, which is usually separate. Here's the receiver coil. The uh, 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 are those slides popping? I guess they are. Um, the preamplifier, usually some form of noise muting, and the signal is then split up into a number of identical channels, uh, identical with one important um, difference. Um, these are the various gates which open at successive times. I you would usually would show here 20 gates to uh, analyze the decaying transient by virtue of taking 20 time samples throughout the decay. Each of those outputs then goes into a stacker. We keep adding the, uh, 
the samples to improve the signal to noise. Uh, and then finally, the data is sent to a data logger. And at any one measurement, at any one, uh, for any one measurement, there are then 20 channels of data which represent the decay sampled at 20 time gates. You people know all about that. Oh, one thing I should show here is that we must tell the transmit, or we must tell the receiver uh, the um, point at which the current is on its duty cycle. In other words, we have to make sure that the receiver initial gate starts just after transmitter turnoff. And we do that usually either with a reference cable or also fairly commonly with high stability quartz crystal oscillators. We use the oscillators obviously to get rid of the, of the cable which can be a nuisance. Um, the oscillators have to be very, very stable. You're looking for mic a few microseconds over four or five hours. So they're not simple and they're not cheap. They're oven controlled oscillators. To synchronize the system, uh, once or twice a day you bring the transmitter and the receiver together and you actually adjust the timing between the two so that each knows what the other is doing and you can then take them apart. And unless you drop the receiver or something like that, and the oscillators are also shock mounted, usually you can rely on the synchronization holding for several hours. Okay, this is the important um, uh, waveform slide. Again, the, the uh, uppermost section shows the primary current. By now, you people are thorough experts in all this, but it shows the, uh, whoops. <laughs> Should get a haircut and that wouldn't happen. Um, it shows the transmitter current waveform as a function of time. It's periodic. Here's the period T. Um, and there are two parts of it that are of interest. Uh, whether we like it or not, I might add. One is the turn on time, which is usually exponential. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. And the other is the turn off time, which is usually a ramp. As, again, as Alex pointed out earlier. And as you now also well know that the flux linking the target is exactly the same, shows exactly the same time behavior as the current in the transmitter. Okay, as a result of Faraday's law, uh, there is a, uh, an EMF which is induced in the target, which is given by minus, which is left off the slide, d phi by dt. So in order to see what that EMF looks like, uh, we of course take the derivative of this waveform, we see that the slow turn on gives us a small exponential decay, as I've shown there. The very rapid linear turn off gives us a rectangular pulse of duration delta t, the ramp time. And this continues on periodically, as shown in the slide. Note that this is the EMF in the, uh, in the target. It's also the primary EMF or the EMF from the transmitter turnoff in the receiver coil. Okay? So as soon as we turn the transmitter off, the receiver sees an enormous great spike. The EMF on the target causes current to flow. More about that in a few seconds. Um, I show here only the current that flows in the off time these little pulses of voltage will also generate transients in the on time. But again, as you well know, we choose to make measurements in the off time, and that way we avoid any noise caused by variations in the transmitter current when it's flowing. So what the receiver sees then, again, is the primary pulse from the turnoff of the transmitter. And it also sees, being a receiver, 
a signal which is proportional to the time rate of change of the target current. Again, through Faraday's law, the receiver output voltage is proportional to d5 by dt from the target, and I've shown that here. So that the receiver output consists, as far as we're concerned, as a number of pulses of this short sort. What we do in the receiver is we put in a very strong um, switch, if you like, to blank out this part of the pulse. It's due only to the primary field uh, uh, inducing a voltage directly into the receiver coil. It contains no information about the, um, the target. It really tells you only about how far the receiver is from the transmitter. The uh, picture here is, is inaccurate in that this thing is orders and orders of magnitude larger than the transient that the receiver has to measure. And so we have to take a lot of effort to get rid of this thing so that we can measure the near time behavior. What sort of amplitude can they be? Good. 20, 30 volts? Yep. Volts. And these things are microvolts, okay? Exactly. It's huge. Okay, so we're going to go into the, uh, the algebra, or the electrical engineering, if you like, uh, for a brief bit to try and learn a little bit more about the current responses, or the target responses, and how they're affected by the instrument. <coughs> Again, the voltage in the target consists of a rectangular pulse, assuming we've got our linear ramp turnoff. The duration of it is delta T, the ramp time, and the amplitude of it is delta phi divided by delta t. Uh, that is the change of flux from transmitter on to transmitter off, which is phi naught, the primary flux divided by delta t. And we note that the area under this pulse is given by the product of these two. The area is simply the primary flux intersecting the target from the transmitter. Okay. The target is represented, as we said, by a simple RL circuit with time constant L over R, and it's being excited by this little string of voltage pulses. And the answer is, what sort of current flows as a result of that excitation? To solve that problem, I've chosen an electrical engineering uh, way of doing it. And basically what I do for any one of these pulses, let's take this one here, I say, okay, that looks like a step function. And then I add here another step function of the same amplitude but opposite polarity. And the net result is that little pulse there. Are there any, pro any questions about that? Do you understand what I mean? If I can make this up by a step function which starts here and goes on to infinity. At this point here, I add a negative one, which goes on to infinity. And obviously, the algebraic sum of the two is, is the little rectangular pulse. And when I do that, my current in the target is given by this expression here. It's the EMF, the peak value of EMF, divided by the target resistance. And this first term is the response to the ongoing step function. And then I add, at a time delta t later on, this response, which is due to the negative going pulse. Note that most people, ourselves included, start the time at zero right here. The odd man out, I think in this case, is Syratem, that started there. So that, that's an important difference to keep in mind between the various systems. And the equations which I show assume that t equals zero uh, occurs at the end of that pulse. So that's why this term here contains t plus delta t. That's from the, um, from the pulse turn on at minus delta t, if you like. And this is the turn off measured at time t. Okay. I can simplify that equation uh, when I do, and I put in that E is delta phi by delta T. I end up with this equation. I have here an amplitude, 
an exponential decay and a modifier to the amplitude, okay? The time behavior of this equation, of that current, is simply an exponential decay, e to the minus t over tau, no surprises there. The um, amplitude is a function of the voltage, phi naught over delta t, of the resistance in the target. There's also another factor out here, which is the width of the turnoff time, the ramp time delta t, divided by the time constant of the target. We'll spend a few minutes looking at this. Let's suppose that the time constant of the target is much greater than the ramp turnoff time of the, uh, of the transmitter. So we're going to assume that we have a time constant or a transient decay which is very, very long compared to this little, with well, a time constant which is much larger than this turnoff time delta t. If that's the case, this equation simplifies. We uh, put the, um, the low parameter approximation for the exponent, and the equation for the target turns out to be very simply that the current that flows is given by an exponential times initial amplitude given by phi naught over L. And I'll spend a fair amount of time discussing why the initial amplitude is phi naught over L. Does anybody remember the answer? The current that flows in the target, the initial current that flows, say again? Yeah, it's the, fl the, the current that initially flows in the target immediately after the transmitter turnoff is exactly that current which is required to make the flux through the target the same value that existed before turnoff. Does that ring a bell? Good. Okay, and that's of course, and again as Alex pointed out, that's the definition of inductance. Inductance is the flux per unit current, and here we have just enough current flowing to make the flux the value that existed before tur turnoff. So there's the very simple equation for, and this is basically what we call the impulse response of the target. Simple exponential with initial current given by that expression there. The receiver measures again d phi by dt for the target. And so it takes the derivative of that expression and we end up when we take the derivative of the exponential with a tau in the denominator of the initial amplitude. And this is a characteristic of impulse response systems. The receiver output is proportional to 1 over tau e to the minus t over tau. Nobody can forget that. You have to remember it. So this says that more resistive targets, i.e. targets with a short time constant, will have a very large initial amplitude, but they will decay rapidly. More conductive targets with a large value of tau will have a low initial amplitude, but will decay more slowly. Okay? That's, again, a very important fact. An iron ruled, quote Alex. Okay, and as I say, we're measuring the target impulse response. Okay, what happens on the other hand if the gate, if the, if the duration of the ramp is much larger than the time constant? In that case, the, um, if this is the drive, this is the EMF, what happens now is that they, the target ramps up and then decays after the termination of the, um, of the, uh, of the drive. If the target has a, um, um, a drive which is much longer than the um, time constant, the target actually has time to go right up to its final value and then decays. 
And we'll see that this makes an interesting difference in the response. Because if this condition is met, the target is response, the target current is now given by phi naught over R delta T, e to the minus T over tau. And the receiver output is given again by the derivative uh, is again given, yeah, is given by the derivative of this. That brings a one over tau out in front. Tau is equal to L over R. The R's cancel out and we get the L left in the receiver initial amplitude. But the big difference now is that the voltage out of the receiver, again exponential, but this time it doesn't have an initial amplitude given by one over tau. It's simply given by one over delta T, and delta T is a constant. So in this case, if the target, as long as this condition is met, if the target, if we have two targets with different time constants, they simply display the exponential decay appropriate to each time constant. The initial amplitudes of the two targets will be the same, assuming they have the same inductance. So I say now that the initial amplitude is no longer a function of one over tau, and we say in this case, amongst the electrical engineers, that we're measuring the target step response. On this slide, I show the receiver response for any value of tau. In other words, I assume I have a selection of plates, if you like, that are th whose time constant varies from very long compared to the turnoff to very short compared to the turnoff. On this axis, I show the logarithm of time. On this axis, I show the log of the receiver output voltage. And let's look first at the case where the time constants are much greater than the ramp time. This is called the impulse function, you'll recall. And in this case, the response is one over tau, e to the minus t over tau. You'll recall also that an exponential on a log-log plot looks like that. And so, for example, for my longest target time constant, there's the response. If I go to a less conductive target, but one for which this condition is still obeyed because of the one over tau, the initial amplitude goes up. Again, if I go to a target with even shorter time constant, but one which is still within this condition, the response, the initial amplitude, again goes up. But now as my targets get less and less conductive, this condition is no longer satisfied. The time constant is less than the ramp turnoff time. And what happens is that the initial amplitudes thereafter for all my targets are the same. Does so it make sense? OK. Um, That's correct. Exactly. If you want to measure, that's a good point, Graham. If you want to measure short time constant targets, you should have a you should have for a variety of reasons a turn off time which is very fast. This behavior was actually the basis of the original Newmont patent many, many years ago. Newmont with their EMP decided that what they would do is not go after the fastest ramp time that they could achieve, but that they would use ramp times of moderate duration. Why did they do this? Because Newmont were always looking for elephants, big, big, big targets. They didn't want to be bothered by little peddlers uh, with short time constants. The short time constant targets would just be a problem to them because of the one over tau, e to the minus t over tau. When they went across the survey profile, they would see the short time constants preferentially. As I'll show you in the next slide, they didn't want that. So they used long values of turnoff time and actually patented the technique. So I show you here schematically the situation with two targets, one of which is a resistive target, 
one of which is a conductive target. In all other respects, they're identical size, depth, etc. Ignore the fact that they're at different distances from the transmitter. I'm assuming that I'm using an impulsive system, which most of them, which is what we all try to do. The resistive target will have a high initial amplitude that rapidly decays. The conductive target, a low initial amplitude that decays relatively slowly. So my profiles as I go over those targets will look roughly as follows. There's my early time response from the poor conductor. It's large. There's my early time response from the good conductor. It's small. Here's the late time response from the poor conductor. It's small. Here's the late time response from the good conductor. It's relatively larger. But you can see what the problem is, and you can see what Newmont we're trying to avoid. If you've got these two targets very close together, and these profiles are close together, you may find on occasion that this large initial amplitude, and indeed for the other earlier gates as well, swamps the, uh, the response from this, and you may have difficulty seeing the, uh, seeing the better target. Now, there's a way of getting around this, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's fairly easy to do with the data, and I will show you later on um, how it's done. I should state in fairness to you, Tam, that because they use a different transmitter waveform than we do, they do measure the step response of the targets directly, and, and they don't suffer from the same pro from this problem which all the impulsive systems do. They, of course, have the disadvantage because they measure during the on time that their data is sensitive to changes in the intercoil spacing. The off time systems, the impulsive systems, don't suffer from that disadvantage. Okay, I mentioned that there's a way of getting around it. The problem was that the response was 1 over tau e to the minus t over tau. Uh, and we'd like to get away from the preferential excitation from the initial amplitude 1 over tau. It turns out that if we take the integral of the receiver voltage from t to infinity, minus that integral, that we come out with phi naught over L e to the minus t over tau, which is basically, you may recall from an earlier slide, uh, an expression for the current that flows in the target. And you'll notice that the tau out in front has disappeared, and in effect, we're now measuring the step response. So what you can do with any impulsive response data is numerically calculate this integral. It's very simple to do. If, if here we have log time and log bz of t dot, because we actually measure dbz by dt, then our decay might typically look like that. Here's the data from one, channel two, and so on down. And here's channel 18, and then what happens is the data starts to get noisy. So the last usable data point that we might have is channel 18. OK, in order to take this uh, integral, we need to know what the response looks like out to time equals infinity. And of course, we don't know. But what we do, and Incidentally, this is an approach which is not widely used. Uh, I, I think it should be widely used. It has some real advantages. It costs you nothing to do. You got the data, and the technique is extremely simple. And it really, it really changes the appearance of the data. So what I do with this decay, first of all, is I extrapolate from the last known data points to guess at what, the, uh, at what the behavior is for the rest of time. And then, if this is my channel 20 position, I calculate numerically the integral under that curve. That's easy enough to do. You can do that. Usually, you, you figure out that this 
the k is t to the minus m, where m is some power, and, and you can just uh, analytically integrate it to get the value of the integral at the last channel. And it will be in error because you've made a guess about what the decay is uh, after the last channel. But it turns out the error is not usually very large unless you've made a hell of a poor estimate in the, in the way that it's decaying. OK, assuming for the time being that it's perfect, that there's no error, there is your value of channel 20. It's the integral of the extrapolated signal. Your new channel 19, that is your integrated, vanil of integrated value of channel 19, is simply this area plus this area. In other words, it's the new channel 19, or, which is the integral, is, the, is your calculated data for 20 plus the value of the response at 19, modified by an expression for the gate width. Your new channel 18 is simply that sum plus the data value at channel 18, and so on up. And so when you do that, what you've done is converted your data in the form b of t, b dot of t, into b of t. And the only harshness that you've done to the data is add a, 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 an error in the last data point, usually of less than 50% of the actual data value. All of this data suffers from that error in the zero, which usually the values are going up so rapidly at early times, don't forget these are log scales, that a small error in the last channel quickly disappears. Are there any questions about that procedure? I'm sure there are, but you get the rough idea of what I'm talking about. Okay, okay I'll, I'll tell you later why we do it, but w the first and foremost reason is to get rid of this one over tau. And I'll show you at the end of the talk an example of that, and it really works. Okay, I'm going to describe in a few minutes the design of time domain EM systems. Before I do that, I have to know what the signal that we're trying to measure, the transient responses that we're interested in, in analyzing, look like. So I'll spend a few minutes discussing typical target responses. Alex described earlier today the response from a sphere. Uh, I show here a conductive sphere in a uniform magnetic field. And he described how at very early times, the currents flowed only on the surface of the sphere, and they were distributed to be a maximum in the equatorial plane and a minimum at the poles. With the passage of time, these currents decay, um, and they generate currents, in essence, further in the sphere through Faraday's law. And as he pointed out, eventually, the, uh, the s there, there are currents relatively uniformly distributed across the sphere itself. This is a plot which is much like the one that he sketched. Again, I look at the equatorial current as a function of distance out from the center uh, to the uh, radius of the sphere. And it simply shows, as did Alex's, and note that this is a log plot, that at early times, the current is very, very closely confined to the surface of the sphere. As time progresses, and as he pointed out, what we're really interested in is time with respect to the late stage time constant. These currents move slowly inwards into the sphere, and eventually, at some time, roughly of the order of tau, the currents stabilize, and thereafter, the response falls exponentially. That simply says what I said. There's uh, a plot showing the dipole moment of the sphere on a log linear plot. And we can see that at a value of t over tau of the order of 1, the decay becomes linear on our log linear plot. And that, of course, is the characteristic of an exponential decay. OK, that was a bounded target, as Alex said. Iron rule that all bounded targets obey the same principles. 
Initially, currents flow on the surface. The response falls rapidly with time. Eventually, however, the currents will stabilize the resistance and inductance of each current loop, if you like, in the target is well defined and the response falls exponentially. Alex is about to start to um, describe the fall, <laughs> the response of unbounded conductors. Um, unfortunately, I'm a bit ahead of him here. Basically, I show here a transmitter located on the surface of a conductive ground and when I turn off the current in the transmitter as rapidly as possible, currents flow only on the surface of the ground uh, in the near vicinity of the transmitter. This is not an awfully good slide. The currents are closely confined to the region of the transmitter. And why do they do that? Because immediately after turn off the magnetic field everywhere in the half space has to be the value that existed before turn off and so this current flow in essence is such that the ground doesn't know that the transmitter is turned off. But because of eddy currents in the ground, these currents start to decay. That causes a changing magnetic field in the ground. Through Faraday's law, the changing magnetic field causes an, e causes an EMF. EMF causes current. And the net result is, as you know from Alex's talk, that with the passage of time, you get cur a current loops, if you like. They're not really loops. Uh, I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. But these rings of current um, uh, pro diffuse down into the ground to greater and greater depths, and their radius also increases with time. The next slide that I'll show is actually a contour map from Nabigian is a very famous slide, so everybody has to show it, um, of what the current density in the ground looks like as a function of time. Okay, here's the surface of the Earth. Here's the loop itself. This is uh, a section, so this is distance down into the Earth. And what you see there are contours of the current density at a specific and early value of time divided by sigma. The normalization for this behavior is such that the behavior is controlled by the ratio of time divided by sigma. So we see that at early times the, uh, the currents are closely confined relatively to the transmitter. With the passage of time, the currents move radially outwards and downwards, and these contours simply show the current density at, uh, at successive intervals of time. Please bear in mind that these are not loops of current going this way, they are contours of the current density going into the board. So have, uh, how many of you have seen the slide before? Great, good, okay. So you, all, you understand it, no point in talking about it further. One thing I should point out is that the, the point on the surface of maximum current density occurs oh, pretty well over the, the maximum current density in the ground. Uh, sort of interesting to calculate where those currents are as a function of time for ground of different resistivity. So I, I assume now that wrapped around me I have a dipole transmitter. I shut it off at time t equals zero and I ask myself what's the radius of those current loops as a function of time for a ground of different resistivities. And I start with a thousand ohm meter ground and this slide shows against time in milliseconds the radius in kilometers of the, uh, of the maximum point of the current flow. And we see that in a thousand ohm meter ground by two milliseconds that the currents have disappeared two odd thousand meters out there. So in resistive ground the currents go like that and in no time at all, they're way the hell and gone over there. 
As the ground gets more conductive, however, the situation changes. And if, for example, we had 10 ohm meter ground, and that's very conductive ground, well, can be seen though. Now at two milliseconds, the currents are only 200 meters over there. They're still very close to me. And it's important to remember that when you have conductive ground or a conductive overburden, the currents diffuse out fairly slowly. And, and if you're going to get galvanic current component effects, that's why they occur because the, the currents diffuse, it's one reason, the currents diffuse out fairly slowly. Okay, what does the magnetic field look like from those smoke rings of current? And we can guess at what they look like. We assume that the transmitter was here on the ground. At some time T, the field looks like that, for the sake of argument, for a simple ring somewhere underneath us, centered on the transmitter. If we calculate the field, from this ring of current on the surface, the magnetic field from the ring of current. Right on the center of the ring, of course, the field is vertical. As we move outwards, the field starts to tilt, and eventually right over the current ring, it's horizontal. Further out, it's tilted in the opposite direction. I'm showing here just the vector direction of the field. I am not showing the amplitude, okay? particularly accurately. Suppose we're measuring the vertical component of the field as we go out in this direction. We see that initially the field has only a vertical component, so it might look like this. As we get out to the wire or to the current loop, the vertical component goes to zero and then reverses direction. The horizontal component is zero at the center goes up to a maximum over the point of maximum current density and then decays thereafter. You'll hear much more about that from Alex. Here's one of Alex's simple little equations. Uh, this describes the behavior of the uh, dBz by dt from a dipole transmitter. In other words, I'm not using a large loop for this. I just put a dipole out there. I have a conductive half space and I turn off the current in my transmitter, and I measure the voltage out of my vertical receiver coil, a distance uh, R away. R, 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 yeah, R. Anyway, um, I put the slide on only to scare you to death. <laughs> um, I, I think it's complicated, Alex, I hate to say it. Um, Basically, it is a reasonably complicated function of, of time, the resistivity of the ground, and also the distance out to the receiver coil. But the good news is that at late times, this equation substantially simplifies, and the expression for dBz by dt becomes this. Okay, what is this? This is a constant. This is a rho to the three halves power, or conductivity to the three halves, rho to the minus three halves, rho to the three halves, um, one over rho to the three halves. Basically, the resistivity to the three halves power and time to the minus five halves power. You'll remember that with the confined conductors at the late stage, the response always became exponential. Incidentally, don't forget why we're doing all this, because these are the signals we're going to be measuring with our receiver. We've got to know something about them if we're going to design our receiver properly. So for the homogeneous half space, what really interests us is that the behavior in the late stage is a power law, t to the minus 5 halves. Note, incidentally, that if I do that integration procedure, which I outlined here, that in essence, instead of getting dBz by dt, by integrating dBz by dt dt, I get the magnetic field response, and that it's proportional to t to the minus 3 halves.
and that means that it's falling a lot less slowly with time than the voltage in the receiver coil uh, given in this expression. And that means, in essence, that the dynamic range of the data is greatly reduced. Okay, and our last uh, target will be a horizontal thin sheet. This represents conductive overburden. In this case, when we shut the transmitter off, uh, the currents can't go down into the ground, which is assumed infinitely resistive. So the currents go zotting out in the overburden. They go out with a velocity which is proportional to one over the conductance of the, um, of the sheet. That means that if the sheet isn't terribly conductive, once again they go zip and they're way out there before you know it. But if the sheet is relatively conductive, a couple of Siemens for example, they go out very slowly and they're always lurking around over there. The response for a horizontal thin sheet falls off very rapidly. The signal voltage from the receiver falls off as t to the minus 4, and that's really a rapid decay. How are we doing, Peter? Uh, I'm doing very well, I'm not quite sure what you're saying. No, I'm fine. I wondered, you want to take, I, I lost track of when we started it. Do you want to go on for another 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll have a break? Uh, just like a couple more minutes and then, and then have a break. Okay, good, because there's a fair amount to cover here, so. Okay, so basically then the summary of the responses from unconfined conductors is you get a large response, you get complex time behavior if you take into account the early time behavior. Uh, at late time, the decays follow a power law rather than an exponential decay. Okay. Now you've had a good look at what the Earth responses are going to look like. You're going to set out to des design your EM system. And your objective is to make a transmitter which turns off rapidly. You want to know how rapidly should I turn it off. Uh, you're going to make a lot of time gates. You want to know where should I start my measurement time, what are the limits as to where I start it, how wide should I make the gates, what are the factors which affect my choice of gate widths, etc., etc. So far, just to quickly recapitulate, we showed uh, the difference between impulse response 1 over tau e to the minus t over tau and step response e to the minus t over tau. We said that it's nice to get rid of the 1 over tau factor. We showed how to integrate back up the curve. And then before going on to design our receiver, we looked at the responses from various typical targets. Basically, confined conductor, homogeneous half space, and a horizontal <coughs> thin sheet. So now we're going to look at the system responses for about the next half hour. And we're going to look at the various factors which distort the measured response. And again, to summarize, two types of response, exponential and power law, and now well known to yourself. There are three types of distortion, uh, and they are the fact that we use finite gate widths. Obviously, that will distort the signal. They are the fact that we use a finite transmitter turnoff. You remember our ramp has finite extent in time. And also, it turns out that, of course, our current in our transmitter really isn't a step current. It turned off here, it was zero here, it turned on here, and so on. Back in time, uh, it's actually an alternating square wave, and that also affects the response. Okay, gate location and width. We see that since the signals usually decay more slowly at later times, the gates can become wider with time. Why would we want to do that? Because if we do, we can improve the signal to noise ratio for the later gates where the signal's dropping out of sight. And if we can widen the gates here, we'll see that we improve the signal to noise 
Uh, we're worried that we may start to distort the signal, and we'll look into it to see if we do. The gates in most, well, the gates <laughs> in a well-designed receiver are, I would say, logarithmically spaced in time, as are the gate widths. And here I show you, uh, and again, it's no secret for the ProTemp system, I show you the location of the gates in time on a log log scale. Also shown here are the responses from an exponential, uh, a, a homogeneous half space, and a horizontal thin sheet. Okay, dealing with the horizontal thin sheet, which is the worst of the targets because of its very rapid decay, we see that over the width of one gate, and these are actually the, the pro tem gates, so that's, these are to scale. Over the width of that gate, there's quite a large change in signal. And the question is, are we knocking the signal all to hell, or, or are we okay? The situation is not quite so bad for the t to the minus 5 halves of the homogeneous half space. And for the early stages of an exponential decay, and you must bear in mind that bounded targets only decay exponentially at late times. I show this as being exponential for all times. In fact, the response would come down as 1 over root t at early times, uh, and, and then mold into this. But, but even with that, we see that exponential targets are not usually a problem in terms of distortion of the response from these finite gate widths until we get out to very late times, and usually we can't see it again, we can't see it anyway, so that's not a serious problem. Okay, but the power law decays are a problem, so let's look at how we distort them, and they are a problem because these systems are designed right from the start to be used for geoelectric sounding, which, when all is said and done, is a lot tighter constraint than searching for massive sulfides. Okay, uh, what is the effect of the, uh, of the finite gate width? Obviously what the gate does is it takes the numerical average of the changing signal over the gate width. Delta TG is the gate width. And I calculate, I'm sorry about the popping slides there. Not too good. Uh, I calculate first for exponential decay what I call the distortion factor, which is the measured signal di divided by the true signal, and it's simply derived by taking the integral over the gate of the response and dividing by the true response. It turns out when you do that that the distortion factor is a function of the time constant of the target divided by the gate width. And then it's given by this expression here, where that factor appears three times. And you note that, the, uh, that it's not a function of time. In the case of a power law decay, I arbitrarily set the power law decay as minus m. Again, I calculate the distortion factor. And, and incidentally, this is what we did when we designed the system. These are the sort of things that you do when you're going to make a time domain. EM system. Uh, and in this case, the distortion factor is a function of time. And the parameter which dictates it is basically the gate width divided by the time of measurement. Now, you'll note that our gates are logarithmically set down the time range. The widths are also logarithmically set. The narrow gates are very very, the early gates are very narrow, the later gates are wider. So in our case, we've decided to operate the system so that this ratio is a constant, so that the distortion factor for a power law decay is not a function of time. All gates distort the data equally. Okay, I show here the distortion factor which is the error due to the finite gate width for the three types of decay.
and dealing first with the exponential decay, you use this scale here, and it shows that the, uh, that the error is large for large values of gate width compared to the time constant. And that's fairly obvious. You know, you're, we shouldn't be too surprised at that. If we have large gates and we're measuring an exponential decay uh, and the gate width is large compared to the time constant, we will have some distortion. In the case of the um, power law decays, the scale is the gate width divided by time. You remember that with our logarithmic gates, this is a constant factor. In fact, our gate widths are given are about 25% of the time at which the gate is located. So in fact, for the system, delta Tg over T is 0.23. That's up here. And we can see that the distortion is pretty small. It's worst for the t to the minus 4 decay. And if you actually look at the number, the, the distortion is about 4% of the actual signal level. In other words, we consistently read 4% in error. It's better than that. It's about 1 or 2% for a homogeneous half space. So that's the big advantage of spacing the gates logarithmically. You have constant error out in all time. And if you make the gates narrow enough, you make a fairly small error in the signal. You can use wider gates if you want, but you make a significant distortion. What you then have to do is, in any forward calculations that you do, Alex is nodding in his head. Any forward calculations that you do, you have to take into account that wide gate width. And this is what UTEM does. They have fairly wide gates. Their factor there is delta T over T is unity. And so you can see that you get very significant distortion of the responses. They, they say, well, that's not going to worry us. We're just going to use, in all of our forward calculations, those wide gates. Our experience has been that people forget to do that. Um, and so we, we elected to make the gates narrow to give minimal distortion of the signals. You'll see later we don't pay much of a price for that. OK, um, as we make the gates wider, we distort the signal. Also, as we make the gates wider, we increase the noise that that gate will accept. If you assume that the noise is Gaussian, randomly distributed, it turns out that the, uh, that the noise, as a function of gate width, and it doesn't matter where the gate is, obeys this sort of relationship. The, um, the integrated value of the noise within the gate goes up relatively slowly with gate width. So that as we make the gates wider, we saw in the previous slide, we distort the signal. As we make the gates wider, the noise goes up. But the question is, what does the signal to noise ratio do? And the next slide shows the, um, the results of calculations of the signal-to-noise ratio as a function of gate width over gate location. And we see that the result is that if we initially make the gates wider, in other words, wider than zero width, that the signal-to-noise rapidly increases as we make the gates wider, and that it peaks at a gate width of about 60% of the gate location. And thereafter, if you make the gates wider, the signal to noise ratio actually falls. And the reason for that is that if this is your decay, here's the center value. As you make the gates wider and wider, you lose more when you integrate this quantity from this contribution than you gain from that contribution.
So from that slide, we see that there's a very broad maximum as far as signal to noise ratio is concerned. Um, and we said, okay, if that's the case, we like to keep narrow gates because we don't want to distort the signal for our soundings. If we have uh, a value of delta T over T of 0.23, we don't distort the signals appreciably and we don't really deteriorate the signal to noise ratio. So we'll live with that. And that's again why the, why the gates have been chosen to be fairly narrow. Yeah. Gate for each channel sits in the center of the integration gate. Yes. Is the distortion factor being improved by selecting a different time within that gate? Yeah, um, yeah I, I, that's a good question. I haven't really looked at it very much. My instinctive answer is, is, is that it can't depend on where you put the gate. You know, it looks at some point as if it does, you know, where you put the nominal gate time within the gate. Um, we'll have to try it out sometime and see. My, as I say, my instinctive answer is no, that it, you know, that you can't gain anything. It's sort of cheating to say, okay, here's the gate this wide. Do I call the gate, you know, the actual time of measurement there or there? But uh, it's a good question. <laughs> Give you some graph paper in it. Okay. Okay, so we discussed the effect of finite um, gate width on uh, s distortion of the signal and also on the signal to noise ratio. Um, the next point is that the transmitter turns off in a finite length of time. The EMF in the, uh, in the target has finite width delta T I now call it delta T sub D for drive. And the question is, what does it do? Oh, no. Le left ahead of myself for a sec. I'm going to look for a second at the turn on of the transmitter. Ah, fully. OK, I'm going to look at this behavior here. Um, it's, it's, it's moderately interesting. It has one feature which we'll be interested in later. But I want you to look at every aspect of the system simply because it's important to know how they're behaving. So what controls this? Turn on time. What we do with these systems, and I think all manufacturers do the same, is we just slam a voltage on the transmitter loop, a voltage V, and the loop has resistance R. And as a result, the current has this behavior, 1 minus e to the minus t over tau. In other words, it goes up exponentially with time. Uh, the V is the power supply voltage. R is the loop resistance, which of course is a function of the actual amount of wire that you've got out on the ground, and also the diameter of the wire. So if you use different, uh, different loops, different wire diameters, you'll notice that your turn, off, turn on characteristics differ. Tau, of course, is L over R. The loop inductance is determined primarily by the loop length, R also by the loop length and, uh, and wire diameter. Uh, so you can very quickly work out for yourself what sort of turn-on characteristics you're going to get. And tau is typically one millisecond for the larger loops that we use of number 10 wire, 300 by 600 meters. One thing that you should note is that at least in the case of our transmitter, and you should ask about the others, uh, our transmitter is a constant voltage source. That means that if over the day your loop resistance changes as a result of temperature, so also will your loop current. Better but more expensive is a constant current loop. Okay. The turn off time. How do we do it? We simply, uh, you, these loops are large. They have lots of inductance. You can't suddenly just break the current into the loop because you get, if you do it infinitely fast, you get inductively an infinitely high voltage appearing across the, uh, the loop terminals, which will 
do great damage to your transmitter. So I think most of the manufacturers do what we do, which is simply uh, remove the power, supply voltage from the loop, and at the same time we clamp a Zener diode, which is a device that holds the loop terminal voltage to a fixed value. And the result is that E equals minus L di dt. We fix the voltage across the loop terminals, and thus this equation gives us the behavior of the loop current. Obviously, di by dt is a constant given by the value of the Zener diode and the loop inductance. It's constant, so we get our nice linear ramp. The other point that one asks is how long is the duration of delta t, what controls it? And the answer inverting this equation is that delta t is given by the inductance of the loop, the change in current, i.e. the loop current, and the voltage of the Zener diode. What does this mean in practice? It means that if you take a fixed geometry loop and run it at double the current, you'll double the turnoff time. It means that if you um, uh, change your loop dimensions, again, the inductance of the loop is a function of the loop length, uh, generally. And so if you use two different loops, one larger than the other, it will also show a larger turnoff characteristic. These are very simple little things, but if you're out doing surveys, they're important to know. It, it is, but in general, that's a secondary effect. Okay, there are other effects from the conductive ground, which we'll learn about in terms of the excitation of the target. But in general, um, Peter, I, I should, I should um, uh, be cautious there, because eventually, if you have very conductive ground, it obviously will start to do, affect it. Um, I've not done the numbers, and I've, I've, I've not seen that it happens. I've never heard anybody say that it's a problem, but it's, it will happen if you, if, if you go to extreme conditions. Okay, the turnoff time then is determined by the current that you're turning off and the inductance of the loop, and it varies from very small loops, 10, 15 meters on a side carrying a few amps, from about one microsecond to large loops where we might be running 500 by 1,000 meter loops at 20 amps, and you'll have 500 microsecond turnoffs. And those turnoffs we'll see are really significant in terms of what they do to the target response. You'll remember that I said here in my initial discussion that if the, uh, if the turnoff time was much less than the time constant of the target, it looks like a delta function. When the turnoff time was much longer, it seriously affected the initial amplitude of the exponential decay. Okay, it's a very straightforward matter. Given that the, um, that the EMF induced in the target looks like a rectangular pulse, is a rectangular pulse, to use the convolution theorem we simply break this pulse up into a lot of little vertical delta functions, and we add the response of the target to each one of these little delta function drives that have occurred before t equals zero. Thanks, Peter, that's great. Okay, and when you do that, lo and behold, what happens is you discover that your distortion factor turns out to be exactly the same as having a large gate width. If you have a transmitter turnoff which is large, it simply translates into all your data as if you had a large gate width for each of the gates. Obviously, if this is large, there's not much point in, ha in busting your butt to try and get very narrow receiver gates because in essence, you've distorted the signal with your drive. If, on the other hand, you've got very narrow receiver gates, as we do, it means you have to pay as much attention as possible to trying to narrow down that pulse so you don't spoil the effect. Okay, again, I calculate the, um, the, the distortion factor for both the exponential decay and power law dis 
decay. And again, I get the same parameters I did before for exponential decay, only now instead of delta T gate, it's delta T drive over tau, and similar effect for the, um, uh, for the power law decay. The difference is that now, for the power law decay before, I told you that we kept this ratio, this was the gate width, divided by the time we kept the gate, this ratio constant. But now this delta TD is our, uh, is our turnoff time. Obviously it's fixed and we make measurements at different times. This ratio will differ. These things are only of great interest to designers, so don't worry too much if you don't fully understand them. If you really want to take a look at the figures in the, in the, uh, in the, in the notes that you've got, and, and they're fairly st straightforward. Okay, um, this, this simply slide, this slide shows, and I'm going to ignore the time, con the exponential decay because I'm more interested in the sounding curves. For the sounding curves, Again, the, um, uh, the parameter along the x-axis is the uh, ramp time divided by time. Obviously, this is fixed. As time gets larger and larger, I move this way on the graph. And so what that shows me is that uh, if I take, for example, the t to the minus 5 halves, that for large values of this parameter, i.e. early times, the large drive turnoff, which is like a large gate, makes a very serious error in the measurement, but that as time progresses, I automatically move down this graph, I move up the curve, and eventually I reach the point where the distortion factor for power law decays is not too bad. But it tells us that for those decays, power law decays, we have to be very careful to what happens at early times. We, we have to keep the gates narrow, and we'd like to keep the drive as narrow as possible, too. Okay, run-on effect. This will occur to everyone who does time domain EM soundings at some point. It, it's um, simple to understand, and it's very important to recognize Again, we do our measurements out here. What I show is the square wave transmitter current uh, at times earlier than the measurement time. The measurement time is done in this quarter period out here. Well, taking the derivative of these pulses to look again at the, uh, at the target EMFs or the ground EMFs, we have this pulse here which is the one that we're most interested in because we're making the measurement out here. But the turn on time also, of course, causes a pulse. And if it's nice and rectangular, as I've shown, that will look like this. And that will also affect the measurement out here. The point to be made here is that if we're working at early times with respect to a quarter period, the response from this drive is easily the most significant. But when we start working out here at the later gates in our quarter period measurement time, the response from this one is not nearly so dominant. This one actually starts to affect the measurement out here as well. So also will these earlier ones, but usually these two are the most significant. This one is always in the opposite direction to this one, so that the decay from this one will be reduced in amplitude, particularly out here, by the response from this oppositely directed pulse. So out at late times, my decay will decay too quickly as a result of this, um, as a result of this pulse. How can we get rid of that effect? Well, it's easy. We can drop the base frequency. If, if that waveform is tied into the base frequency, and suppose I drop the base frequency by 10, then 
instead of being, uh, for example, one millisecond long, this would then become 10 milliseconds. Yeah? Um, how much of that is also a factor of the uh, time, um, time response factor? Um, if, you, if you've got... Yeah, 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 yeah. ...which yeah. is much greater than, say, the time response factor of what we're measuring. Yeah. Correct. It's a function of the power law, if I understand you correctly. It's a function of the nature of the decay. If it's exponential, it turns out that you simply subtract two exponentials. It's constant with time. But it's with the power law decays, which are really relatively slow, even though t to the minus 4 is pretty fast. Out at the late times with the power law decays, this, this, this previous pulse will make quite a difference. So, as I was mentioning, we can get rid of the effect by, by dropping the base frequency by 10, then this thing disappears over there, and, it measurement, and our measurement out here is affected only by this. But we want to keep the base frequency as high as possible. Why? Because the higher it is, the more stacks we get in a given interval of time. In other words, the longer we integrate the signal. Also, the gate widths are tied to the base frequency. So to accurately measure the early time behavior, we want to use a high base frequency because the gate widths are narrow, and as we've discussed, we then don't distort the signal. What happens is shown on the next slide, and I'll show you the response uh, not to a decay, but to the apparent resistivity as a result of this effect, which we call run-on. Oh, first of all, I calculate, and, and not too many people will be interested in that, I calculate the distortion factor uh, to the run-on, first for an exponential decay, and Secondly, for a power law decay, there's an error in that slide. I haven't quite figured out what that's supposed to be, but it's not tau. Okay, and again, I'm not going to worry too much about the exponential. I'm more interested in the power law decay, which uses a, the, now the time scale out here is the actual time of measurement divided by a quarter period. And I told you earlier that this run-on effect is very small for small times compared to a quarter period because then we're snuggled right up against the turnoff and the influence of the earlier one is, is small. But once we start getting out to t over t over 4 of the order of 1, that is we're measuring right out at the end of the quarter period, then we see from these two little curves here that there is a small but significant amount of distortion. And as was pointed out a minute ago, the degree of distortion depends on the, on the power law decay. It's worse for the t to the minus 5 halves because the signal is falling more slowly. Now, that doesn't look like a lot of distortion, but if you're doing soundings, you have to do everything in your power to make the data as accurate as possible. You know, these are, these are accurate measurement techniques. Uh, you can get, you know, accurate geoelectric sections if you, if you design your system properly. What I show here is a plot of apparent resistivity versus time. Yeah, Peter, if you don't mind, I'm sorry, that's awfully disconcerting for you. Um, I said earlier that the, in the late stage, and Alex will discuss this in detail, that from a homogeneous half space, the dBz by dt was proportional to t to the minus 5 halves. Uh, it's also proportional to the resistivity to the 3 halves. Just as you do with conventional resistivity equipment, you can invert this equation, and Alex will talk about that in detail tomorrow, and you can define an apparent resistivity, which is a function of the measured voltage 
as a function of time. And that's what I've done here. And what I've plotted here is the apparent resistivity against the log of the root time. And what I show, first of all, is this function for a high base frequency. And the correct curve looks like this. When I make the measurements at the high base frequency, my early data is fine. But once I start getting out to the end of the quarter period, the signal is too low. If the signal is too low, the apparent resistivity is too high. So what I then do is I crank down the base frequency, and my data now starts here. It does this. But once again, when I get out to the quarter period, it's too high. Again, I crank down the base frequency, and I get this sort of response. It starts here and is in error here, but we don't realize it. This effect, you'll see in your sounding data, the commercially available uh, inversion programs such as Temex recognize it and take it into account. So you can feed this data in quite happily, and it all comes out in the wash of the, of the geoelectric suction. But what you'll find will happen is that people who are doing soundings will um, do measurements at several base frequencies. They'll get this effect, and they're very, very puzzled by it. They don't understand what's causing this, and they, it, it obviously destroys their confidence in the data. Its effect is, is quite predictable, and it's not really a problem once you know that it's there. OK. Syst oh, I won't fight you, <laughs> thanks. Uh, the, next, uh, the next concept is the bandwidth of the receiver. You remember I showed a coil and a preamplifier. Well, somewhere in there, there's a filter which determines the overall bandwidth of the system. <clears throat> if we make the bandwidth very, very large, we start picking up radio stations and a lot of garbage. If we make the bandwidth, too, and we thus destroy our signal to noise ratio, if we make the bandwidth too small, we start to seriously, dis really seriously distort the signal. And again, there's my, for the sake of argument, my, my filter is sitting in the, uh, in the uh, preamp. Okay, you remember on this slide earlier, I showed you the signal coming out of the receiver coil, and I said it has a large primary pulse due to the transmitter turnoff and a vastly smaller transient arising from the currents in the target. Here I show ideally what that response looks like, and here I show what happens if your receiver bandwidth is too small. This is a really serious effect. And it's something that, that I don't think is enough attention is paid to. Basically, the, uh, the delta function comes out of the receiver looking like this. Superimposed on that is your actual decay. And the net result of the two of them is something that looks like that. And you'll observe that there are two effects. The first is that the transient is seriously distorted by, uh, by this effect. Uh, in fact, it's completely lost at early times. And secondly, it's delayed at late times. At late times, this curve and this curve have the same functional shape, but there's a, a significant delay. Now, the point is that we gate out this signal with those fine switches in the front end of the receiver but there's nothing that we can do for this. And so having too low a bandwidth will significantly distort your early time behavior. The other problem is that this comes from the transmitter. And that means that as we move our receiver coil closer to the transmitter, this thing goes scooting up. The ground response may stay roughly the same, but this effect is definitely a function of position of the receiver relative to the transmitter. And indeed, it limits 
in many cases how close we can actually put the receiver coil to the transmitter wire. In theory, we're working in the off time. Once we turn the transmitter off, we don't care. As Alex would say, we can roll it up and throw it away. Unfortunately, having too low a receiver bandwidth destroys that, and you get what we call feed through of the transmitter into the receiver. That's a, a significant and serious effect. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Is it possible to um, do a chain of comparing the uh, gate width and the ground time and so on to to suit the service? Yes. Yeah. It would be you know it would be more expensive, but um, we built, for example, an EM42, which was a totally digital receiver. And what we did was instead of using finite gate widths, we just time sliced the signal. We took the whole transient, time sliced it. It was a deep penetration system, so we, we had 400 microsecond wide gates. I think they were. That sounds awfully wide. Anyway, th they were all of uniform widths, and we just stored the whole darn transient. Every transient we took got individually stored and thrown into the data bin, and then you go home after that, and you, you use that raw data and you come up with a lot of different noise suppression systems, which, for example, might include adding the gates up to make new gates. Uh, and, and we did quite a lot of that work. In general, if you're selling commercial receivers and you sell something that that's, fle that's that flexible, you can rest assured that 85% of your users will end up with gates that wide for time constants that, that much. So it requires a pretty sophisticated user to, um, to use. OK, dynamic range and linearity, both very important quantities. This is more than you ever wanted to know about time domain EM. And, and I suspect a large, who said yes, I heard her. Uh, <laughs> But one day you're going to be out there in the fields using, if you're unlucky enough, using your time domain equipment. The flies are going to be awful. The snakes are going to be all around. And something's going to be wrong with your system. And you're going to remember back to the nice air-conditioned lecture hall. OK, what is dynamic range? Dynamic range is the transfer function of the system, shown in this simple little graph here. Along this axis, I have the input signal. And this line gives me the output signal. OK, an ideal system has a transfer function, which is a straight, 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 straight line. And then as the input signal, and think of it as being a sinusoid, OK? As the input signal finally gets so large in amplitude that you hit the voltage rails, um, any, any amplifier, here's your coil, here's your amplifier, runs from plus V and minus V. And obviously, if your amplitude gets larger and larger, eventually your signal amplitude gets so large that, the, uh, that the, you hit the voltage rails. And what happens is that the signal, in this case here, hard saturates. So it comes up, does that, goes down, does that, and does that. That's ideal. If, if a system does that, you're very pleased. Because saturation is a pretty easy thing to recognize. You look at it on your display screen, and you can see the noise hitting the rails. And you know you've got your gain turned up too high. You have to turn down the wick a bit to get rid of this. Much more ser oh yeah, here's the picture right here. Much more serious is progressive saturation. And what that means is that as your signal gets larger and larger, you've got a small but finite amount of distortion in there. You don't know it's there. And in a second, I'll show you what, uh, what it does. Basically, the dynamic range is the largest measurable signal. And that's set usually by the voltage rails divided by the smallest measurable signal, and that's usually set by the system noise. One of the problems with time domain EM 
particularly the impulse response systems, is that t to the minus 5 halves fall off. It means that the response falls five decades for every two decades in time. If you want to measure that decay for any length of time, you have to be able to measure it with a very large dynamic range so that you can accurately see its whole decay. And here I show, uh, I illustrate the five decades in two decades, and I take two cases. I assume that I have a receiver with a dynamic range of 10 to the 6. In other words, the largest to the smallest signal is a factor of a million. In a noise-free environment, uh, I show here the transients coming in with crystal clarity from the ground. And if my rails are set at one volt, my voltage rails are set at one volt, what I do is I crank up the gain until these peak signals are one volt. And Bob's your uncle. I can now measure signals as small as a microvolt, because my dynamic range is 10 to the 6, and so I can measure way out here. Unfortunately, the real world is never like that. In general, you have all kinds of sources of noise, typically power line noise. I've shown it looking like a sinusoid. It never does, but it's big and ugly. So what happens is that you now can crank up your receiver gain only, again, so that the total signals don't exceed one volt. If my noise is 100 times the peak signal, that means that when I've turned up my gain so that my total signal hits the rail at 1 volt, it means I can only measure the signal out to 10 to the minus 4 units instead of 10 to the minus 6. That's an enormous reduction in your ability to measure the decay characteristics. And for that reason, it's of critical importance that you get the dynamic range as large as possible. I mentioned uh, the business of hard saturation versus soft saturation of your response. If you have soft saturation, you get what's known as intermodulation distortion. If you go home and look at your speaker specs for your stereo system, you'll see that the IMD is usually specified. And what that is, is the following. If you have an amplifier which has a nonlinear transfer function, and you feed in two signals of different frequencies, the nonlinearity of the response will give you an output component at the difference frequency of these two. If your amplifier is completely linear, omega 1 in, omega 1 out, omega 2 in, omega 2 out. But if your receiver is slightly nonlinear, you get a little of the difference frequency out. Now suppose that these are two radio stations, one running at a megahertz and the next one running at 1.1 megahertz. The problem is that after they've gone through the nonlinear device, you have the difference frequency out, which is 100 kilohertz. Now, uh, your system is designed to handle 100 kilohertz systems as long as they come from the ground response. You start feeding noise through it at 100 kilohertz and big trouble with your data. So that it's very important, again, to have an ultralinear system to avoid this. And this happens in all geophysical systems. Probably the most common mistake in their design is not to give them enough dynamic range, because it's not obvious that you need it. And I remember Doug Fraser, who had his airborne Digim system, and he observed to me one day, to, to his surprise, that when he turned the transmitter off, that the amplitude of the spherics noise halved. Well, it shouldn't. In a linear system, if you turn the transmitter off or on, the spherics noise is completely independent. In his case, it wasn't because he had a little intermodulation distortion. OK, this simply shows you what dynamic range looks like. This is a plot of, um, of, of our system.
to an exponential decay. Basically, we just make up a circuit which gives us an exponential decay. And you can see that the response is exponential on a log lin plot over probably better than a million to one. We're just starting to get into the noise system out here. All the other points fall on, on a straight line. So that's the sort of response that you're looking for. Okay, another problem with these systems comes when you turn off the transmitter current. Ideally, you turn it off and it stays off, but we all use, Alex's theory is the best. If you want to turn off the transmitter current, cut the loop with scissors. Much the best idea. If you use semiconductor switches when you turn off the switch, if, when you turn off the switch, if you look very closely at what's left in there, lo and behold, it's, it's ugly. It's usually fairly high frequency and it usually goes on for quite a long period of time. And of course, this limits where we can put our first gate. Because if we put our first gate too close, uh, we're going to just start seeing the noise in the loop from the transmitter turn off. One caveat here, I've heard many, many examples of people taking an oscilloscope out in the field to look at their transmitter turn off characteristics. And they, they put a resistor in the loop uh, to measure the current and they connect it up to the, uh, to the uh, input of their oscilloscope. And what they don't realize is that the dynamic range between the, uh, this current here and the tiny little signals that we're measuring there is about uh, 500,000 to one. And so what they do is they put their scope on the, on the loop and of course the first thing they see is the voltage from the turn off of the transmitter and they say, well that's not very pretty. I actually want to look at the little bits of noise that follow that. So they start turning up the gain of their oscilloscope, making it more and more sensitive. And what they don't realize is that the oscilloscope itself has a very limited dynamic range. And if you hit it really hard with a pulse, even though you've shifted the pulse off the display, um, you know, you've knocked the, you've knocked the preamplifier and the scope all to bits. And so as you crank up the gate, you don't see this, you see the poor old scope preamplifier gagging away with the large pulse you've just given it. Uh, so again, this is an important effect. And it limits how close we can put our first gate to the turnoff time. You will hear it said by some manufacturers that they have gates which run one microsecond after the turnoff time. Well, you can put the gates anywhere you want. It's easy to do that. But if you run your gate up, up close to the transmitter in time, to the transmitter turn off, you know, all you're going to see is the transmitter turn off. Yeah. With a receiver. <laughs> With your time domain receiver. You first make sure it's working properly, and then you start moving the gates into the turn off. Yeah. It's the only instrument that has a dynamic range to let you look at it. Was there another question? Okay, good. Yeah, don't use a scope. Okay, um, further quickies. Um, system response receiver coil type. What kind of receiver coil do you want to use? You've got your choice. You can either use lovely clean air or you can use ferrite. My attitude is you use ferrite if and only if you have to. Air is much nicer. It has a problem. Air cord coils are bulky, but they're extremely linear. You don't get any magnetic, you don't get any transients from air, and you don't get any microphonics from air. The problem with ferrite cores is that you get two types of core response from them. First of all, unless the cores are really non-lossy, you get eddy current response from the core itself. And you usually see it only when you bring the receiver coil right up to the wire. 
You also get sticky susceptibility. I've forgotten what you call it, SMA, or um, as you, uh, you know, if, if you pulse a strong magnetic field into most ferrites, when you take it off, the domains don't decay instantaneously, so you get a tail out of your coil. And again, you'll see it only when you bring your coil close to the transmitter wire. But if you do, there it is. Microphonics with coils, with ferrite cores, are a real problem. Most ferrite cores are made up of segments of ferrite like this, and they're glued together. These surfaces are very plain, and they're, they're flat. Um, but if you do the numbers, you'll quickly learn that having that little gap in your coil plays hell with your response if it varies at all. And that tends to make the ferrite coils very sensitive to microphonics because the axial dimensions will change just a little bit. But that's enough to give you a lot of microphonic noise. So in a surface system, um, I, I simply wouldn't consider the use of ferrite. In a borehole coil, borehole system, you don't really have much option. You probably have to use ferrite, but wait one for the last word on that. But ferrites are a problem for these reasons. Usually they're not too serious in the borehole because you never bring your ferrite cord coil too close to the transmitter. Measured components. Okay. You can measure uh, a single component, and I'm talking now about large loop systems, but some of my remarks are more generally appropriate. Um, or you can measure all three components. I don't have a slide for it, but if you look into your notes, there's two pages of carefully reasoned argument for using three component receiver coils. And without question, that's what's coming. You know, you get more data, even though you can theoretically show that, the, uh, that you can derive, in theory, the X response from the Z response, the noise levels are different. There are lots of differences. And, and in general, as time progresses, we're all going to be using three component coils. Peter, how are we doing? I have about another, I told you that tonight was going to be different from last night. Um, I have about another half hour. Would you like to um, try and talk, Alex? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah, would you like to continue tomorrow? Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you tomorrow.